So, Gaurav, we'll start in one minute. Sure, sure. Hi, everybody. Okay, it seems it's already 2.30, so we can, we can start, so. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, webinar. Today, we have uh, Dr. Gaurav Bhatnagar from Ahsoka University. Uh, before going into the main talk, let me just briefly say a few things about the system. Um, so please use the chat option uh, to ask any questions that you might have. And uh, after the talk is over, I'll put those questions to Gaurav. So in case uh, your connection is lost in between, you can watch uh, the live stream on Facebook. I'll share the link here uh, in a few minutes. Um, so basically that's it. Uh, let me introduce Gaurav. Um, so Gaurav is a visiting associate professor at Asoka University. Uh, he obtained his PhD in mathematics from the Ohio State University in 1995. And after his PhD, he spent uh, working at Ohio State and the Indian Statistical Institute in Delhi. Then he joined industry where he made uh, significant contributions to the teaching and uh, learning processes of Indian school. And after a long stint in the industry, he came back to academia again. And since 2015, he has held the positions at the Indian Statistical Institute in Delhi. University of Vienna and the School of Physical Sciences at JNU. So now he's uh, in Ahsoka University. Uh, his area of research is in number theory and spatial functions. And today he's going to speak about uh, George Andrews's approach to conjecture the Rogers Ramanujan identities. So Gaurav, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Manjil. And it's a real pleasure to be speaking uh, uh, to this. Uh, uh, to this forum, I've been uh, long been an admirer of Gomit Sora, and I'm really happy that Manjil uh, asked me to come here. So I just want to, uh, uh, if you can, uh, if you can see my video, I want to point out behind my shoulder there is a collected works of Ramanujan. If you can see it at the back, at the back, and. Uh, Ramnujan is one of my heroes and I'm sure one of your heroes too. So what we are going to do today is, uh, um, is a discovery approach to one of Ram Ramnujan's uh, or two of Ramnujan's very famous identities. And this discovery approach is due to Professor George Andrews of Penn, uh, Penn, so Penn State University. And it came in, his, uh, in a number theory book by him. But of course, it's been sort of reworked by me a little bit. And uh, uh, more than Ramanujan, we'll be talking about Euler. Uh, and the topic is, uh, is partition. So now I'm going to just start sharing my screen. It's a Blackboard talk. So I will write and I hope you'll be able to see what I'm writing. Okay. And uh, again, uh, let me again uh, reiterate, uh, if you have any questions, I won't be able to check the um, check the chat very quickly uh, uh, all the time. So please ask and Manjil can interrupt me and maybe ask your, answer your questions, okay? Feel free. So the topic is uh, partitions, first of all. Uh, now notice that I'm going to write over here. So I'm going to write in this window, which is a little bigger, but you can read upstairs or downstairs and then uh, uh, over here, over here, uh, everything is written, uh, written uh, is visible in any case. Okay. So, what are partitions? First of all, what are partitions? So, let me uh, let me give you an example right away. Uh, so, you write some number as a sum of other numbers. So two plus two plus one plus one. So this is just an example I chose. So I've written 15 as a sum of other numbers, five, four, two, two, one, one. And this is an example of a partition. And the thing to note is that uh, in a partition, um, it's an unordered sum. So four plus five and five plus four, these are both same. They're considered the same. Okay, 
so uh, typically we write the partitions in some kind of a decreasing or a non increasing order so that we we don't get confused you know 5 plus 4 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 is the same as 4 plus 5 plus 2 plus 2 or 2 plus 5 plus 4 so just to avoid all that we we write it in a decreasing order and it has a, a pictorial view so uh, in general everything in mathematics i don't know if you have noticed as as symbolic view pictorial view uh, and the uh, the idea is that the symbols and the pictures if you can relate very well then uh, then it's a lot easier so here is a here is a picture for the same thing what you do is you have uh, you put a box 1 2 3 4 5 for each number then you have two then you have two then one and one so this is five boxes four boxes two boxes two boxes one box one box and this is known as a young diagram and this represents a partition so when you think of a partition you think of it as a number and then you can do another thing you can uh, so you are reading the boxes in rows you can also read them in columns so how many boxes are there in columns so this is six boxes and this is four boxes and then two to one and you get another partition right so right away we have our first theorem and that is that the number of partitions of n with a uh, less with largest part k is equal to number of partitions with less than equal to k parts so i hope you can read me your handwriting i certainly can't but that that doesn't stop my students so what are uh, what is the largest part in this partition 5 plus 4 plus 2 the largest part is 5 number of parts is you know 5 is one part 4 is another part and so on so there are six parts so number of partitions of n with largest part k so you count by rows and number of partitions with less than equal to k part if you count by columns so the proof is there is a one i'll just explain this term again one to one correspondence between the two sets so what you do is you take any partition uh, which has uh, largest part k and then you that's by reading through rows and if you read through columns you get a corresponding partition with number of parts less than equal to k and there's a one to one correspondence so what does one to one correspondence mean i just want to explain it so suppose that let's see how many people are there there are 154 people in this uh, in the zoom call and we go to an auditorium and the guy says that the auditorium has 154 seats how do we figure out if we don't count well now there are 156 but anyway so uh, how do we know for sure that there are the same number of seats as participants in the auditorium so one way is that you count both of them and say both of them are count to 154 and that's why they are the same the other way is that you ask everybody to sit down if everybody is able to sit down that means the chairs are more or at least 
the number of participants and vice versa if there's no nobody left standing that means that uh, the uh, you know the number of participants is less than equal to so ultimately if all the chairs are occupied then we know that it's the exact same number and no chairs should be empty either so that's a one to one correspondence you take two sets here one set is uh, num all the partitions of n with largest part some fixed number k and all the partitions with less than equal to and you uh, you establish a one to one correspondence you so say this one corresponds to this and the correspondence in this case is through conjugation one is by rows one is by columns okay so that's our first theorem uh, it's an immediate kind of theorem Uh, which follows from the pictorial representation and uh, again i think it's probably due to euler everything what we are doing more or less is due to euler except for the last bit where i'll get to so here is a uh, here how to enumerate so i want to talk about enumeration and uh, this is joint work uh, with my Uh, collaborator akosh bal so what we do is we uh, we we have a symbol we use a symbol which is not so this is not the way you see it in textbooks uh, it's something which is new but uh, what we represent is we represent uh, by a symbol xj we represent a uh, a part j by xj so uh, here's the So two x one plus two x two plus x four plus x five. This was our partition which we started with. This stands for one plus one. This stands for two plus two. This stands for four, and this stands for five. And when you sum up all these, you'll get your fifty. So, um, so this is what we are. Uh, so we are just representing x j. Uh, uh, representing the part by x j and what it does is it helps us make a table very fast. So here, here's a table. Let me make a table. Okay, so uh, here's n. Here I'm going to list the partitions, and I'm just going to count the number. So I should add p n is the number of partitions of n. so so for zero i will explain in a second uh, there is no partition but we still say number of partition so i'll represent a blank partition like this uh, zero does not have a partition but it has one partition i'll explain why short so this let me uh, go over uh, there is a there is a comment yeah um so vishal has pointed out that uh, it should be Uh, equal to k parts, not less than equal to k parts. Uh, in the theorem that you stated. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. So sorry. This should be. So. Uh, let me actually do something else let me put a less than equal to k here so at most at most k parts uh is equal to number of partitions with less than equal to k parts so vishal is that okay yes it's fine okay thank you thank you okay so n equal to 0 i'll just explain why we are taking one but for one there's only one partition which is x1 so there's one of these and then for two what we do is so you have a partition this x1 you read as one so if you have a partition if you add one to it that is a partition of two so i represent it as 2x1 so 1 plus 1 and then in addition i have a x2 here So there are two parts. 
two partitions here. Then uh, I add x1 here. This is a partition of three. So one plus one plus one. X1 plus x2 is a partition of three. And then x3 is a partition of three. So we add a symbol each time we reach that number. So x3 is added when we reach three. Then four, four x1, two x1 plus x2, x1 plus x3, right? And now if I notice that if I add two to the one step previously, I will get a partition of four. So I'll get a two x2 here and an x4. So there are partition five of them. Let me do one more. So five x1, add one, three x1 plus x2. So if you add one to each partition of the previous guy, you get a partition of uh, x5. So two x1 plus x3 and x1 plus two x2, x1 plus x4. Then I add, then I add two to the previous guys. So if I add two to three x1, it's already covered. If I add x2 to x1 plus x2, it's already covered. But what I want to add is uh, uh, x2 plus x3, right? And then I have another one, uh, x, x5. So how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so you get the idea on how to enumerate it. So this is easy to program in a computer too, if you want to just enumerate all of them. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is one, um, uh, you know, interesting way. So I just want to highlight one more, one of these, this guy, x2 plus x3 is coming by adding x2 to two steps before. And then you get the idea. You can, when you go on, you can add x3 to the previous three ones. So here, if you're adding x3 to this guy, it's already covered. x3 to x2, it's already covered. Okay, so this is the second way of looking at partitions. First way is pictures. Second way is sort of symbols, which we are, uh, uh, which I just showed you. Uh, so to represent the partitions. And the third way is through generating functions. Okay, again, this is due to Euler. So what did Euler do? So Euler considered this product. Now I have a variable one minus Q, one minus Q square, one minus Q cube, and so on. So he just considered this. And then what he, uh, what he did was so Euler was a master of symbolic computation. So I'm just going to put over here what he did. He used this geometric sum, which you see in, uh, I guess, 11th grade. And he used it on each of these terms. So one over one minus Q, he used uh, the geometric sum and he got one plus Q plus Q square plus so on. Then one over Q square, he took the generating uh, geometric sum and he got four plus so on. Then one plus Q cubed plus Q raised plus six plus Q raised plus nine plus so on. And all the, all the factors, he just multiplied them all together. So how does one think about it? Uh, how, how does one think about this product? What you do is you, you know, they're infinite. Each of them, each of the products is infinite and all of them are infinite. So it's, it's well beyond our capabilities to handle that. So we just pick one thing. Let's pick one guy. Let's pick something here. Let's say, let's pick two here uh, from this guy. Two I picked from here. I pick this four here, sorry, this four here. Don't pick anything here, then pick later. So suppose, so I'll just write down what I'm picking. So I pick two from here, four from this guy, right? Then I pick a four from later, then five or something like that. And this two 
I think of it as one plus one. So this two I'm thinking as one plus one. This I'm thinking two plus two. So if I'm taking something from the first guy, then I think of it as one plus one. So it's better to think in terms of pictures again. So I'll think on terms of I'll think like this. So I put a picture here. This is the first product. This is the second product. Oh, no more. And this is the third one. So you can have three boxes here and so on. So essentially what you're getting is you're getting some kind of a boxes here in each guy, whatever you're picking, depending on what you're picking. So you get a lot of terms like this. So think of it as a sum over partitions. So each term, if you're picking out a finite number of terms and putting them term together, it represents a partition. And then um, and you, you collect all the terms, collect all of them, which have N boxes and what you get is P of N. So you get N going from zero to infinity, which means P of zero plus P of one Q plus P of two Q square and so on. Okay, so now, now how does one get, now let's go back. How does one get the one in this product? You get the one by just taking this one, multiplying by this one and so on. So P of zero, which is the coefficient of Q raised plus zero, you get exactly one. So this explains why P of zero is equal to one. Here you take all ones. Yeah. So, uh, so this is called a generating function and I'm going to just write it down again very carefully. So uh, here is what we just did. We said that one over one minus Q, one minus Q square and so on is equal to one plus Q plus Q square, so on one plus Q square plus Q raised for four plus so on and then going forward, one plus Q cube plus so on. And that is equal to the number of part uh, generating function, this sum. Which means the coefficient of Q raised per N. So whatever is in front of Q raised per N gives us this number. So if, 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 we, uh, if we know how to multiply and, uh, this, then we can find out this, cal calculate this number if you're so interested without any numerator. So this is this is very uh, beautiful and uh, um, you know uh, interesting way that Euler considered this product. Now you can do the same kind of thing with many different kinds of partitions. So let me ask you. Suppose we want partitions where each part. is odd, right? So the first, first term here is giving, uh, is contributing one, one plus one, one plus one plus one, so on. This part is contributing two, two plus two. So if you want only odd numbers, which is one, three, five, you ignore this guy, right? And the third part is giving one plus, uh, um, let me write it better. Third part is giving um, the third one is giving three, 
3 plus 3 and so on. Fourth, you have to ignore. So what we are getting, if we want the generating functions, we want the generating function for partitions where each part is just an odd number, then we will want only the first one. Then we want miss the second guy. We want the third one and so on. So essentially what we want is one over one minus Q, one minus Q cubed, one minus Q raised to five and so on. Is that okay? So similarly, suppose I want partitions with each part distinct. Distinct means I don't want one plus one. I want one or not, there's no one. If two comes then two comes, two plus two doesn't come. So what do I want? I don't want these guys. I don't want this chap. I don't want this chap. I don't want, uh, you know, Q raised plus six, Q raised plus nine in the next guy. So what is the generating function? Generating function is one plus Q, one plus Q square, one plus Q cube, and so on. Then back to our friends. What about partitions with largest part less than or equal to K? Here, we just take the first k terms. Generating function is one over one minus q, one minus q square, and so on up to one minus k. So I don't want k plus one, k plus two, k plus three. And this is also the generating function with partitions with less than or equal to k parts. Because we just proved the theorem that these two guys are equal. So if, if uh, so the coefficient will be. Okay, so let me, let me use these ideas now and give you a more, uh, uh, an interesting theorem, or again due to Euler. So this one says that number of partitions, uh, which we just saw with largest part less than or equal to k is equal to, no, 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 hang on. That we already proved. Number of partitions with odd parts is equal to the number of partitions with distinct parts. So that's Euler's second theorem. And its proof is as follows. So you take odd parts, you take the generating function of odd partitions, and I'm calling them odd partitions. This is equal to one over one minus Q times one over one minus Q cubed times one over one minus Q raised to the power five and so on. Now I'm missing a few terms. So let me just add those terms. Right, so one minus Q to the four, one minus Q cubed is here, one minus Q raised to the four is here and so on. And then if I just cancel, I cancel this with this, I get one plus Q. I cancel this with this, I get one plus, oh, one plus Q raised per two and so on. And that's the generating function of distinct partition. So there's some little bit of magic here and uh, uh, which Euler was pretty uh, good at, which was uh, manipulating these infinite products. He's doing exactly what we did in eighth grade. Uh, he treated them exactly the same way. 
so there is some justification some some kind of justification which is required so this is a formal proof i should just mention this is formal proof and you need a lot of uh, real analysis to justify it uh, or not i mean you so i think gorov is uh, stuck uh, please give a few minutes few seconds Uh, sorry about that. So Gaurav is trying to join again. Please hold on. Uh, you were uh, you were mute on mute. Okay. Ah, sorry about that. So, uh, how long since I have been out of the thing? Let's Not just... too long. So you were, yeah, you so, were. Let me just go over this theorem quickly. So Euler's theorem: number of partitions with odd parts is equal to number of partitions with distinct parts. So, uh, is that okay, Manjil? Yes. Okay, so what we do is we start with the generating function of odd partitions, which is one over one minus q, one over one minus q cubed, and so on. Uh, right here. Let me change the color. Okay. Um, so this is the generating function of odd partitions we just saw it is equal to 1 over 1 minus q 1 over 1 minus q cubed 1 over 1 minus q raised to the 5 so we only take the numbers we have which have odd parts these contribute and then uh, we multiply mm, yeah we multiply both top and bottom by the missing terms at the bottom so 1 minus q square 1 minus q4 and so on you multiply and then you cancel. 1 minus q cancels with 1 minus q square. It becomes 1 plus q. 1 minus q square cancels with 1 minus q raised to the 4. There will be a q raised to the 6 also in front. 1 minus q. So that will cancel with 1 minus q cube and so on. And if you do it, you will get 1 plus q, 1 plus q square, 1 plus q raised to the 6 and so on. That's the generating function for distinct partition. So I just mentioned that this is a formal proof. Uh, Euler gave this proof. This is a formal proof. It requires some justification. Uh, that justification I won't do, but intuitively this is it. This is the proof. Okay. All right, so now uh, uh, some fancier results also of Euler. So more from Euler. And here I'm trying to illustrate to you what happens when you are thinking geometrically plus this. So in the previous one, uh, we are thinking analytically in some sense, just symbolically. Now we are going to combine the pictures together with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the formulas. So here's what we'll do. So suppose, so now you have to sort of imagine things. So I have a square. Okay. 
so this 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 is a square of let's say k boxes so this is k square and then i attach a partition here attach some partition here of partition with less than equal to k parts and then i attach a partition here this guy let me color it differently this color this guy is a partition with so this is largest part can be with largest part less than equal to k so how does one generate this generating function generating function for such partitions what we would do is we would have a change the color at least so here is a k square then we saw the generating function so we attach a generating function for partitions with less than equal to k parts and then we attach another uh, generating function for uh, uh, for uh, largest part less than equal to k so this whole term will become square so this is a generating function if we expand this in powers of q we will get this kind of partition with exactly k squares over there with some partition attached here and a partition attached here and then if i say sum over all the k if i sum over all the k right then what should i get if i sum over all the k now every partition has some square like this the biggest square and then this and this so you should get all the partitions you should get generating function of all partitions so what you should get is 1 over 1 minus q 1 minus q square And so on, and so on. So, just by making a picture, just by making a picture, Euler could prove this really uh, complicated identity, which looks like this guy is equal to this generating function one over this infinite product. So, one side is an infinite sum, the other side is an infinite product. and uh, let me go back to the other so that's one is another idea what i do is i make a staircase so i add 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on and the largest one is let's say k so i add so i use this partition 1 plus 2 plus 3 and it has k parts so on the right hand side i attach some kind of a so here i add a partition well wow. here i add some partition which is less than equal to k parts so i have a partition i have a partition which has 1 plus 2 plus 3 and then something attached so what i get what do i get i get a overall i get a partition with distinct parts with exactly k distinct parts 
So what's the generating function? The generating function is q raised power one plus two up till k, and then I'm attaching one with less than k parts, which is one minus q, one minus q square up till one minus q raised power k. So this is equal to uh, k into k plus one over two over one minus q up till one minus q to the k. So this is a partition with exactly k distinct parts. And if I sum over all k, if I sum over all k, then I will get all partitions with with distinct parts. So what will I get? What I, what should I get? I should get the generating function. So this is uh, I've forgotten how many. I, this is Euler number four, I guess. Okay, so uh, so that's uh, uh, that's Euler. I hope it's okay so far. Yes. So. Is there any few people have. There is. This might be a good time to. Um. So there is a question which is not really related to what you are saying. Um. Uh, so. The question is that how can we calculate uh, Pn for large value of n? Okay, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, we can maybe discuss that towards the end. Um, so, again, the idea is Euler. <laughs> so, uh, it's Euler is the master of us all, as they say. So, idea is Euler. Let's see if we have time, we will discuss this. But uh, there is an algorithm due to Euler uh, where he uses this uh, particular. Um, um, you know, infinite product to calculate the bigger ones. Okay, so let's see if we have time, we can do it. Otherwise, I'll at least give you a reference. Um, somebody has pointed out that uh, could you check the previous uh, formula that you have written? Is there an exponent of two missing in the numerator? Yes, yes, yes. You're right. Yeah, this should be this, right? Thank you, thank you, yeah. Yeah, good idea. Thank you, thank you very much. So yeah, in the previous formula, it's one plus two plus so on up till k is k into k plus one over two. So it's k plus one choose two, so that two was missing. Yeah, or I think Euler also replaced everything by q square sometimes, but this is a very natural. Okay, let's go on to the uh, to this topic now to Andrew's uh, discovery method. So, well, of course, uh, what uh, uh, what Euler did is also discovery approach. So everything which Euler does is what is known as experimental mathematics. He plays around with symbols and so on, and uh, he calculates a lot. And so does uh, Andrews, and so does Ramanujan, and uh, this is one of the you know themes uh, of uh, um, um, of uh, mathematics now that now that we have uh, powerful symbolic computers, we are able to do a lot more mathematics. Maybe find some patterns which were not uh, previously discovered. Okay. So anyway, so let me let me go on to Andrews' uh, discovery approach. Let's first relook. Um, at the odd and distinct theorem. Okay, and uh, before I do that, let me also mention, uh, write down explicitly that there was a book by Andrews. It's called Number Theory, where he gives this. Uh, his notation is different. So Professor Andrews is a professor in Penn State, and it's uh, he wrote a book in 1971, which has a lot of interesting stuff. And it's uh, uh, um, so what what does what does Andrews uh, do? So he says first of all, let's list. Um, he he looks at he looks at odd, so odd partitions. You look at them and say that these are partitions 
with parts coming from a set. And the set is one, three, five, seven, and so on. I know. So three dots means and so on. So he looks at that. So then he, uh, uh, what he says is, okay, can we um, begin with um, with odd part with the distinct partitions? and find S experiment, experiment. So let me illustrate. Okay, so I'm going to list the distinct partition. So first we have distinct. I'm wondering if I do this, will it improve the things? So let's list the distinct ones. Okay, let's make it as big as possible. So zero is a blank and we have one partition here. Then one, X1 is a only partition. If you have two, uh, so we can't do X1 plus X1. So we can only do X2 because X1 plus X1 has repeated parts. So they're not distinct. Okay, so let's do three. So three, I can do X1 plus X2. I can add one because it's distinct and I can do X3. So that's two parts. Then four, I can I cannot do x1 two x1 plus x2. I can do x2 x1 plus x3. I can do x4. So that is again two. Then five, I can do x1 plus x4. I can do x5, and I can also do x2 plus x3. Now because they are distinct, so there are three of them. Let's do one more. So I cannot do X1 plus uh, X1 plus X4, but I can do X1 plus X5. I can do X1 plus X2 plus X3. Right? Then I can do X2 plus X4. I cannot do X3 plus X3. And I do an X6, so there are four. So, are you getting uh, what I'm uh, uh, what I'm doing? So, uh, here, if I just do X1, if I do X1, let me do it in a different color. If I do X1 plus X1 plus X4, uh, then I get two X1 plus X4. This is not allowed because it is distinct parts. So I'm doing the same algorithm for listing, but uh, 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 but I delete the parts which are not possible. Okay, and here I'm trying to do, uh, discover whether X, what is this X? Okay, and here let me represent the partitions. Here, let me represent the partition by saying PSN. So number of partitions of N in N. So the empty partition is no problem. Okay, so this here's where we have to be careful on, we have to figure out which, which numbers are in S or not, okay? So uh, one has one partition, so X1 belongs to S, this is fine. So this matches so far. Now with X1 as a part, I can get two X1. That already finishes up the number of partitions here. So that means that X2 
I cannot do. Well, let me put it in another color. To the red here. X2 I cannot do. This looking here. Let me put a color here. This is not allowed. Okay, so this is not allowed. So then there's still one. Now I can do three x one, right? Um, there's still just one, and here we have two partitions. So I can put an x three here, and then I'll get two partitions. So x three can be an s. Then over here I have four x one, x one plus x four. I can't put an x4. I can't do uh, x2 plus x2 because x2 is not there in the set. Okay, so all so I'm basically finding out the partitions uh, from these elements in the set. So so I don't have x4. So x4 is not allowed again. This is not allowed. So I have still two. Now I go on four uh, x1. I'll get five x one. I'll get two x one plus x four. Uh, sorry, x four is not there. What am I doing? This was x three. Two x one plus x three is there. X two plus x three I can't have because uh, because x two does not exist. Right, the x two does not exist in this set. So, but there are three, and we just have two. So, I am allowed to have x five. So now again, we have matching numbers. Now for x six, you have six x one, three x one plus x three, x one plus x five. And I can do x. Two uh, x three. So again, one, two, three, four are already there. These are already there, so I cannot do x six. So no x six. So what am I getting? I'm getting. If I look back, I'm getting x one. I'm allowed to have x three. I'm allowed to have. X five I am allowed to have. X six not allowed. So essentially, we are seeing that the first few values of X are X one, X three, X five, and so on. Or I mean, one, three, five, same thing. Because X one represents so. So if we carry on in this way, we sort of discover Euler's theorem that the number of partitions here is equal to number of part. Partitions here, and uh, the key idea is that uh, uh, one needs. Uh, so I'm getting a little bit delayed, looks like. But let's hope they catch up. So the key idea is that we look at look for a set, uh, a set which also satisfies this condition. So now, now what we do for Rogers Ram for Ramanujan's identity, we extend this idea. So this distinct. Can be viewed as partitions where parts are where the oops, difference between two parts. Is equal to one, the minimum distance. So, or we can say the difference is bigger than equal to one. So let's look at partitions. So we look at partitions now. 
whose parts have difference bigger than equal to two. So same thing we do, and we do uh, parts which have a different thing. And the question we ask is. Is there a corresponding set S? Okay, so let's 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 just calculate these quickly. So if I go too fast, then I will make a mistake. So I'll go slowly still. So I hope you don't mind, but I might take like five minutes extra. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So anyway, so we have n, we have these partitions where minimum dif difference between parts is bigger than or equal to two, and their number, whatever the number is, and then over here we will have. Uh, the partition with S, and then we'll find out the S and make a longer stay. So zero, again an empty partition. One, I can have x1. Two, I can have x2. I can't have x1 plus x2, two x1, because the minimum difference is two. So it can't, it have to be distinct in particular. Three, I can't have x1 plus x2. So if I do x1 plus x2, that's wrong, because the minimum distance difference is one. So I can only have x3. Four, I can have x1 plus x3. I can have x4, the two of them. Five, I can have x1 plus x4, x5. I cannot have x2 plus x3, x2. Then six, I can have x1 plus x5. I can't have x2, x1, if you remember. I can't have uh, this thing. I can have x2 plus x4, and I can have an x6. That's three. Then seven, I can have x1 plus x6. Uh, x2 plus x5. X3 plus X4, I still can't have. So that's wrong. X7, I can have this again, three. So on a computer, it's a lot faster if you want to calculate it, but you don't get a sense. So first, first few calculations I always do by hand, like maybe up to 10, then start using the computer. X1 plus X7, then X2 plus X6 is there. Uh, uh, X3 plus X5 is fine. X8, the four, let's just do one more. So now I can have an X1 plus X3 plus X5. That's why I wanted to do x1 plus x8, x2 plus x7, x3 plus x6, x4 plus x5 is not allowed, and then I can do a x9. So one, two, three, four, five, five. Okay, now we try to see what is s. Does x1 belong to s, does x2 belong to s, and so on. Uh, I'll take a few minutes. 
this is empty this is fine yeah you want one of them so yes x1 is there this matches can x2 be there well i can have two x1 now because i'm taking all partitions with parts which are in s so if i have chosen x1 has to be in s i can use x1 so two x1 is there that that makes sure that i don't have an x2 so it matches um 3x1 can i have an x3 answer is no so no x3 how about x4 so you have 4x1 now there are two of them there are two partitions so i can have an x4 here so x4 is okay let's see x5 so 5x1 x1 plus x4 these two partitions i'm anyway getting because i have already chosen 1 and 4 uh so i'm i'm done i can't do any more so no x5 i just put a circle here about uh, with each here 6x1 uh 2x1 plus x4 that's the partition um x yeah that's it we need an x6 that makes it 3 so x6 is there 7x1 i think you get the idea so i won't go on to 9 the net result is that you get these numbers so s has 1 it has 4 it has 6 it has 9 then it has 11 um then it has 14 and so on so it's two sets actually either 1 or 4 mod 5 so the numbers here uh, if we call them m they are 1 and 4 mod 5 so now uh, uh, i just want to now we are getting to the crux of it what is the generating function for this guy generating function for this is 1 minus q 1 minus i'm going to write two products so 1 mod 5 is Q is plus six, Q is by eleven, so on, and you multiply by one over one minus Q is by four, one minus Q is by nine, and so on. What about this guy? The generating function for the other chap. So this was minimal difference two, and remember we had minimal difference one as the distinct part. So here, what the idea is that we add, um, we add this kind of partition. One plus three plus five, and so on. And to this guy, we attach some kind of a partition with less than equal to k parts. So, so the generating function for this guy is q raised to one plus three plus five, so on up till two k minus one. And the generating function. you attach for less than equal to k parts is this and then you take the take the sum over all k and that should equal this product right here and the sum we can write as q raised to k square 1 minus q 1 minus q square So on up to one minus two is for k, and I'll write the product again. It is one minus q, one minus q six, one minus q is for eleven. So on, so on here, and one over one minus q is for four, one minus q is for nine, and so on. And this right here. this identity is due to ramanujan so uh, is... or sorry to interrupt uh, so could you explain uh, the 
the columns once again there are some questions where people did not understand very well which columns uh, go go up a bit yeah yeah this these two columns how you did very quickly could you explain yeah 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 so uh, um, yeah so on the left hand side um so first of all i am taking i am taking these um, partitions with minimal difference in parts have to be two okay so those i list on the left so in the enumerator in, in the in our approach for enumeration we are trying to add x1 to the previous guy to get a new partition add x2 to the two steps before to get a new partition x add x3 to the so we just do that and we don't add the things which are which are not necessary so for example here i'm adding to get this guy i'm adding x1 to this chap to get this guy i'm adding x2 to this guy and then at each step a new x6 come and why can't i add an x1 to here why cannot i add an x1 to this guy why can't i add an x1 to this guy to get something for 6 i cannot add because i want minimal difference to be 2 so i can't have 2x1 plus x4 so keeping in mind the rules i generate these now when i'm going here in the second column so in this column i'm trying to see is x1 in this set or not am i allowed to use x1 as a part or not so x1 is no problem x2 is no problem let's let's look at this guy so if let's look at x5 is x5 a part of this set s or not we already know that one is a part we already know that x1 is a part we know that four is a part so from the previous guy i get 5x1 so 4x1 this 4x1 i'm getting the 5x1 let me color it different so to get this chap i'm get i'm using this guy to get this chap i'm using this guy now i already have two partitions and this guy this chap over here uh in um, in the minimal difference bigger than equal to two already had two partitions that means if i add x5 i'll get 3 2 won't be equal to 3 so therefore i cannot have x5 this is the logic for creating this i cannot have x5 because if i added x5 into the set i will get three partitions so i hope it is clear i mean for 6x1 let me try again from here to get 6x1 i'll add for, uh, x1 to here 2x1 i'll add x1 here and then i just have two of them and here there are three on the left there are three so now i am allowed to add x6 once i have added x6 into the set i have x1 x4 and x6 in the set so recursively i keep seeing whether i am allowed to do uh, uh, add an element to the set or not so i have added oops i have added 1 i have added 4 i have added 6 then i go to 7 i see can, can i add 7 answer is no because i just get it from the previous step then can i add 8 answer is no some more answer so you keep generating the answer as you go along and and the key idea is that uh, on one side you list them on the other side you say is is this set allowed or not so you you do the set okay i hope that explains it better and um, yeah just to uh, uh, yeah i hope to also write it up uh, as a article at some point and put it up and then we can uh, put it up on the ganit sura site too uh, in the next few days uh, anyway coming back to this we have a identity q raised per k square divided by 1 minus q 1 minus q square so on equal to this infinite product and ramanujan this is uh, uh, this is due to ramanujan i'll just tell you its history very briefly but there was another identity which he had here he had k square plus k again 1 minus q 1 minus q square 
up till one minus q raised for k, and this time, this time we had one minus q raised for. Uh, I'll just write it in shorthand form. These k's are congruent to two and three mod five. So earlier it was one and four mod five. Now it's two and three mod five, and this was very similar. So the interpretation of this side is that you start with two plus four, and then attach a partition. So this is partition with minimum difference two plus smallest part. and this side it's clear number of partitions with part with parts congruent to 1 and 4 mod 5 sorry 2 or 3 mod 5 so the the history the history is this that ramanujan wrote uh, uh, these identities to uh, hardy uh, ramanujan wrote these uh, partitions to hardy in 1913 in a letter now in all the letters which were sent at that time these were the first few letters there's one page which is sort of missing but hardy refers to it and says that i got it in this first letter uh, and that page was unfortunately missing and for a while nobody could prove them hardy couldn't prove them oops well suddenly it, uh, my uh, ipad restarted so sorry about that i just connected shortly but uh, the history is that uh, ramanujan um, uh, ramanujan sent them in a letter in 1913 and then uh, Uh, nobody could prove them. Hard, Hardy couldn't prove them. Littlewood couldn't prove them, and whatever. And then um, uh, there was a mathematician called McMahon. McMahon. Uh, he wrote a book called Combinatorial Analysis, and he wrote the uh, these two identities in combinatorial form, in partition form, as conjectures. And then he got a letter complaining letter from a mathematician called Rogers, saying that you know what you listed as conjectures. is uh, actually in my uh, paper in 1984 uh, 1894 so you know 20 years ago and uh, anyway so uh, so and meanwhile ramanujan too found rogers paper in the library so he was you know riffling through various sites and he found a, uh, he found uh, this uh, rogers paper um and uh, then rogers and ramanujan uh, subsequently gave further proofs Uh, so uh, the thing is that these identities have been rediscovered many times, and recently, in about 1980s, it was rediscovered in the context of uh, physics, uh, in the context of the hard hexagon model by a physicist called uh, Gordon Baxter. So uh, somehow these identities are showing up all over the place in very very unexpected ways. You know, nearly hundred hundred um, years afterwards. Let's see now if I can. We started. I hope I'm not lost. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm essentially done with the talk. Let me restart it, and maybe we can take a few questions. So, do you want me to uh, give you a few questions now? Yes. Yes. Uh, there are, there are some general questions which i'll put, put to you um vishal is asking did euler work with young diagrams or were his proofs analytical yeah euler's proofs were analytical uh, as far as i know um the young diagrams actually uh, they were earlier called ferrer's diagrams uh, because they they thought ferrer's had them then uh, then later on young uh, Uh, also used them in his work in in the context of representation theory so now they called it so yeah the the pictorial work came later probably 
and uh, Sylvester was the person who really loved the picture pictures. So he did a lot of work in uh, in partition theory, uh, the English mathematician, and very famous proof was given by an American mathematician called Franklin. So uh, once they saw the pictures and they sort of started relating the stuff. So if you're interested in this pictorial approach and the connection, Hardy and Wright is a wonderful book which has all this material. Uh, so Dipunja is asking how many ways are there to express any positive integer n as a sum of arithmetic progression which contains at least three elements. So I don't know the answer whether this yeah so sorry about that. <laughs> it's so, uh, yeah so you can uh, I guess uh, when you have a question like this there are two possibilities one it has been asked before. Uh, three possibilities asked before and second is if it's been asked has it been answered before and if it's not then you are welcome to try and do it in this case i don't know at all either whether it was asked or but see yeah, interesting these are the kind of questions mathematicians ask themselves uh, so there is a question which asks why are there so many theorems of euler why are there so many theorems of euler okay so well euler was really brilliant guy uh, his, uh, he was very prolific, he worked very hard, and he was also a great natural computer. Um, and he found a lot of these things. So, in fact, Euler is the most prolific mathematician of all ages. Uh, there is a website devoted to Euler's works now. A lot of his works are available. Essentially, all the calculus that we do in, say, high school or in college or whatever was... Uh, developed by Euler in some format or the other uh, in this notation. So Euler's work is actually understandable because uh, he did so much that we use his notation all the time. And uh, I don't know, I mean, there are libraries can be filled with Euler's work. So <laughs> why, is, why is everything done by him? Well, he's no longer there to answer, but he was one of the most prolific and brilliant mathematicians of all time, for sure. Uh, Kukil Raskwa is asking, if we enumerate partitions with respect to the number of parts and the highest summand, then what would be the generating function? Highest summand and number of parts. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, so one can have, uh, you know, a Q and another Z, which keeps track of it, uh, which keeps track of uh, number of parts and uh, and try to work out formulas for that. So yeah, again, I don't want to answer this question, but it's this is probably a question which has been answered before. And people may or may not, uh, I don't think they have found it that uh, this thing, but uh, you never know. Uh, so Ponaki is asking if there is any generating function uh, which connects even partitions to some other class of partitions like the Euler or distinct uh, theorem. No, actually. Um, uh, I, I think there is a negative answer to this one. So this is a natural question to try that you have distinct equal to odd. So what about even parts? Um, so, uh, but uh, you can sort of manipulate the odd equal to distinct. I mean, when you're talking about the generating functions, you can manipulate it to get uh, one over one minus Q square, one over one minus Q four and so on. You can just multiply and divide and manipulate it somehow. So it's not a it's not considered a new question. Somehow generating functions, you can sort of manipulate these things and get get the same answer, similar answer. I mean something attached to distinct perhaps. So I uh, yeah I'm sorry it's not a very satisfactory answer but uh, <laughs> anyway go ahead. Um, Anubrata is asking, so he has a question related to the convergence of all this Q series manipulation. Yeah. So he's asking when you uh, did some, uh, when you did some multiplication with the numerator and denominator while you were showing uh, the odd distinct case, then uh, the generating function became uh, 1 plus Q times 1 plus Q square times 1 plus Q cube and so on. Right. But in the other case, but in the previous uh, step, it was like one over one minus q uh, times one minus q squared. So how is this possible? 
yeah so there's magic there uh, it's, it's, it's oilerian magic um, so first of all uh, uh, just i mean this is for students who have sort of taken some analysis um, we do have uh, uh, extensive theories that we study in undergrad on uh, you know uniform convergence convergence of series of functions and so on so you can regard the each factor as a product the product also as a sequence of functions so you take the product infinite product and you chop it off after n so take the first n terms one can regard it as a sequence of functions and then these kind of uh, uh, you know answers can be found over there so products are also equal to sums because if you do exponential log of a product i mean if you take the log of something and then take the exponential so if you take the log it becomes a sum and then Uh, you take the exponential to get back the product so you can apply that theory over here and there is a similar theory for that so that is one answer number 1 you can do all this stuff justified but we are not doing it over here answer number 2 is we are really bothered about the coefficient of q raised per n so you have a infinite product but only finitely many terms are being multiplied with each other so that is a formal approach to um it's a formal approach to this whole theory where you regard q as some kind of a indeterminate and we just say that this multiplication so these are formal power series or formal products and the multiplication if if an infinite multiplication is not required or infinite sum you know then it makes sense so this is called a formal manipulation of these series and the, in that also this is perfectly legal and works out in in that sense so uh, you know euler was uh, all right as soon as we associate it with some kind of combinatorial object then it's something very specific that we are counting we are counting q raised per n. we are only counting what is the coefficient of q raised per n we are not bothered about anything else so in that context for a fixed n if n is say 1 million we know there is a finite number of multiplication and addition which are going on which a computer can do then we don't really need the series theory and all that but in any case uh, these theorems are correct even when q is a complex number with absolute value of q less than 1 bigger than 0 and you can prove that through the usual convergence theory uh, bijeta paul has a question which i think you like so, uh, so bijeta is asking that you have taken the minimum distance between two Uh, partitions to be greater than or equal to two parts to be greater than or equal to two. Can yeah. we take it to be more, or is it fixed? Can it be bigger than two? Yeah, yeah. So this is a very good question, and in fact, it was asked by uh, Shur uh, earlier, and uh, Shur gave a negative result. Uh, and if you follow this approach, you will quickly get, you know, by the time you reach n equal to twelve or thirteen, you realize something's gone wrong uh, with the approach that I have given. So we tried that. Uh, but what should did was he added some some additional property so he said difference bigger than equal to 3 plus some additional property and then they could find a set s so yes uh, the, this is very live uh, in fact very live and very topical uh, uh, you know uh, research uh, topic even today uh, that uh, uh, for which sets of partitions do you get a nice product on the other side but product means you get a nice set s where you can say okay these if you generate a partition with these sets s you will get that and uh, uh, recently there have been uh, conjectures by two mathematicians uh, two young mathematicians from rutgers university who are doing their phd uh, this shashank kanade and uh, kurt russell kurt russell matthew russell russell and kanade kanade and russell uh these guys they came up with lot of conjectures using some very complicated you know the algebra or whatever methods and they conjectured large number of such identities where uh the difference conditions are more complicated and there are further restrictions but the answer which means the set s is nice and some of these conjectures are still alive right? maybe one or two are alive all rest have been proved but uh, they are they are still being found so yeah this is a good question uh, it has been asked from sure times there was a slightly negative result that for 3 it doesn't work but then if you add further restrictions it does work 
and there is in fact a theorem by uh, Gordon, Basil Gordon, um, long back, which generalizes both the Rogers Ramanujan identity. So it's called the uh, Gordon uh, Andrews Gordon theorem. So Andrews did the analytic part, and Gordon did the combinatorial part. Um, so do, it's a reminder that you you said that you will talk about how to compute PN at the end of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that now. Let me again share the screen. Let's see if works. Is it showing up? Uh, not yet. Yes, now it is. Oh, up. Okay, so let me go down. Oops. I hope I haven't lost any of this. Okay. So, well, this is a slightly longish story. So, I mean, people who are uh, in a hurry can go, but again, this is due to Euler. So what Euler did was, Euler multiplied this guy. This time it's in the numerator. Okay, so the, when you multiply it, you can see now, now very quickly you can see that if this is the case, n equal to zero to infinity. Okay, then what is En? En, so you if you multiply n of the, so you're getting q raised per n somehow. Uh, it's, uh, uh, if you multiply uh, certain terms, you'll get a partition of n and you'll get a plus sign if you have minus this, minus this, minus something you're multiplying. So you'll get number of partitions of n uh, with even number of parts minus number of partitions of n with odd number of parts. Is that clear? So when I'm multiplying these guys, let's say I'm, sorry, let's say I multiply uh, here uh, this and this, okay? I get, I multiply two of them. So I get two and four. So two plus four is six, but I get a partition of six with a plus sign. But if I multiply this guy, uh, then I get a partition of, um, with, with a negative sign. So just collecting powers of Q, I'll get this thing. So what Euler did was he multiplied all of them together. He multiplied about 50 of them together and he got some kind of a, this product. Seven, 12, 15, and so on. So, in fact, I will, I'll just open another share. I was going to give this as a homework, but now I won't give it as a homework. Okay, can you see some? Yes. Okay, so this is a Sage math session. I'm just sharing my screen. And what I'm doing is I'm multiplying one minus Q, one minus, so I'm just multiplying up till N. And I multiplied up till 50 terms and I get one minus Q minus Q square plus Q raised per five plus Q raised per seven minus Q raised per 12 and so on. Let me do. 20, that's easier to see. So what Euler did was he multiplied all of them and then he saw that if you look through, you know, when you're doing 50 and you look through the first few, which become stable, 
then you only get pluses and minus signs you notice that here you're getting a plus 2 but that if you you know this is q raised to 51 so if you go to 100 you will get only plus 1 and minus 1 right so euler euler found the law euler found a uh, uh, for this en he found uh, he found some kind of a uh, okay back to this guy so euler found a relationship like this so now what did he do so he so i'm not giving you the thing but he found it he found that it's very sparse you know only a few numbers are uh, are represented and all the numbers are plus or minus 1 okay and uh, uh, these these are uh, this is called uh, uh, now you can google this it's called euler's pentagonal number theorem now what did euler do so now what euler did was that he said 1 over this 1 minus q 1 minus q square so on is equal to product of pn q raised to n right so that means that 1 is equal to 1 minus q 1 minus q square 1 minus q cube so on product of pn n going from 0 to let me write it down properly this was this pentagonal number theorem 1 minus q q square plus whatever he knows exactly what these coefficients are this was 1 plus p1 q plus p2 q square plus so on now what does he say he says compare coefficients of q raised per n on both sides so he finds how does he compare the coefficient so he'll take whatever this number is suppose i take i want to compare coefficients of q raised per n so i'll take let's say k from here and i will take e raised per n minus k from here from here from here meaning from here and then i sum over k that should give me on the other side i have nothing it should give me zero yeah this is clear suppose i want q raised per n so i have so let's say i have p of n then i multiply by e0 if i have p of n minus 1 i multiply by e1 if i have p of n minus 2 i multiply by e2 all this should sum up to 0 this guy is what i want these are recursively known this is known this is known and so on so euler used this to calculate p of n and in fact this is essentially the algorithm which is in use even today to calculate p of n. so in fact mcmahon uh, used this idea the euler's algorithm to make a long list of partitions and uh, uh, and uh, ramanujan gave a famous formula for partitions uh, which was uh, basically checked Uh, because mcmahon was able to do up till 200 p of 200 he did using this idea he calculated it by hand and nowadays computer science can so note that lot of these e's are zero so the e's are actually non zero only when it's something called a pentagonal number and uh, that's why it sort of it's a quick recurrence relation so for computer scientists uh, we could say it's a recurrence relation of order n square so yeah i mean that's i hope that answers <laughs> the question though i have sort of uh, avoided some of the details so we have a last uh, we have three more questions so the last okay. three questions um so can you prove results by your enumeration technique or with the xi's that is not done by other methods well uh, um so far so uh, so hartosh and i are working on this paper which which we are uh, uh, what we have found is that this enumeration technique is very useful to us to get a 
sense of what are partitions so we are not experts in partitions until we started work on it though i i was sort of an expert in the series business but uh, once we get it, it's very related areas as you can see um, so once we started doing this list we could use this technique to gain intuition very quickly uh, and that intuition has helped us understand other people's work a lot better so for example if you look at andrews number theory book he won't make his tables are the same uh, they are isomorphic but they are not exactly uh this you know exactly they don't come out so nicely so quickly but we so we we've, we've used it for gaining intuition not really for proving theorems uh, but by intuition we have found some theorems some connections and so on so because of the intuition we are able to do more uh, that that much has happened but it has not been published yet we have not uh, been able to, we haven't submit we still working on it so yeah that should answer your question so you mentioned computer calculation several times and uh, you also showed one one such calculation in sage uh, so it's a general question that how do you do this uh, computer calculation what software etc okay so uh, uh, there are several software in the market uh, which uh, you have to either buy or steal but uh, there is one which you don't have to buy uh, you don't have to steal or buy and that is called sage math so go to sagemath.org Uh, I will just share it in the chat. Uh, so I, I have done it. Okay, Sageman dot org, and uh, that site uh, you uh, it's a okay. There you go. So uh, so this is the the program that I showed you is is uh, using Sage. It's a general purpose uh, uh, symbolic computer, and it involves everything in math. Pretty much, you know, anything that everybody does. Uh, in mathematics is being implemented by and large in sage if it's not implemented yet it is being implemented and that's also a problem which we are uh, as as mathematicians trying to uh, solve and it's a general purpose thing it has a underlying language uh, which is python so it's very easy to use uh, it, you can use it for you know to you know finding integrals derivatives all those kind of things making graphs all the kind of things you do in uh, in high school but even things in um, in abstract mathematics uh, you can use it to in fact people use it for that so um, nowadays uh, i think there is a shift in the last i would say 30 years there is a very significant shift in mathematics where computers are being used more and more and if you don't use a computer you are viewed as uh, somebody who is a little bit old fashioned and this is also to be used to learn stuff it's not just there to be used for finding new stuff even when you are learning new stuff when you are checking your results you're thinking about something it's helpful to use the computer and it's very easy to use it's somehow not uh, i would say it, it hasn't showed up in our undergrad curriculum yet um, except uh, very soon it will be show up in ashoka university <laughs> in the curriculum it did show up in jnu last semester the students didn't like it at all <laughs> but uh, anyway it's it's a very useful and very simple way of visualizing stuff in mathematics so the last question uh, of this session is by kosik uh, set and uh, he has a general question so he's asking what kind of books would you recommend uh, for for more detailed uh, description of the things that you have described it today well i think the classic book uh, which i would recommend to everybody is hardy and wright um so hardy and wright has a chapter on partitions now what has happened is hardy hardy is the famous gh hardy whom uh, who discovered ramanujan and uh, uh, so they wrote a very classic book based on hardy's uh, and wright's lectures and uh, it has all the problems and it has been um, sort of modernized by some famous people so i mentioned professor george andrews he uh, went over the chapter on partitions and uh, you know so if if you are interested in mathematics if you are interested in number theory this is not a book which will be taught in um, in the course but if you have hardy and wright by you you can't go wrong and you will get to learn about all the you know lot of mathematics 
uh, why it's being done, what's been done, is because it came from number theory, and that number theory is represented very well in IDM right. Then, uh, other than this book by George Andrews, which uh, Manjil mentioned, there's a book by uh, Andrews and uh, I forget, I think Erickson. Uh, it's called Integer Partitions. That has a very nice and sweet introduction. And uh, uh, for the for these this way of looking at partitions, you will have to wait for a book by uh, Hartosh Singh Bal and Gaurav Padmagar, uh, which will also come very soon, I hope. <laughs> so thank you so much, Gaurav. Uh, we don't have any more questions at the moment. Uh, so it was a it was a very nice talk, and uh, we are really happy and honored that you. Uh, agreed to give this talk and also gave us your valuable time in answering so many questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize for going over time. It's the worst thing that every math teacher wants to do is to take all of your time. So I'm really sorry about that. But anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye.